What determines the fate of a man? His beginnings? A divine sign? His bodily strength? The strength of the soul? The brain? The will? His education? His choices? His opportunities and the ability to recognize their value? Is a man born a leader or does he become one? Babylon, 323 BC. In the center of a vast kingdom that few had dared to dream of, and even fewer would have attempted to create, Alexander the Great draws his last breath. Numerous contestants crave to succeed him, but Alexander decides to leave his royal ring to one of his generals, Perdiccas. In time, many would contest his rule, and one of them was Seleucus, son of Antiochus and Laodice from Europus. But who is Seleucus? Who was his father Antiochus? And what about his birthplace, Europus, the city of Europeans? Only a few kilometers from Pella, heart of the Macedonian kingdom, Europus is in a fertile region inhabited since prehistoric times and incorporated by Philip II into his powerful kingdom. Seleucus's father, Antiochus, was a member of the Macedonian aristocracy. It is possible, therefore, that his son was probably one of the royal pages, the guards of the king, young men trained as an elite unit of the Macedonian army. While the teachings of the great philosopher and thinker, Aristotle, will deeply mark their spirit. Seleucus, a man of robust build, equal only to that of a bull, would follow Alexander in his campaign towards the fabled world of the East and reach with him as far as only Dionysus and Heracles had gone before, a place conceived in human imagination as something mythical, India. Seleucus would go back there 20 years later, but this time, as a king. How will he eventually manage to create something he had not even imagined when he set off with Alexander in his great campaign? Seleucus holds the title of Hiliarch of Perdiccas when the latter is appointed guardian of the kings. He would conspire against him though, along with Perdiccas's dissatisfied soldiers in an act that would change Seleucus's fate forever the brutal murder of Perdiccas in his tent. Soon after, Alexander's successors would divide the empire at Traparadesus in Syria in 320 BC. Seleucus is given the satrapy of Babylonia, a region with a millennial history and remarkable tradition. The old Macedonian kingdom is offered to Cassander, the wider region of Thrace to Lysimachus, Ptolemy took over his beloved Egypt, and Tagonus, the one eye, took control of Phrygia. Feeling left out and faithful to Alexander's vision, Antigonus sets out to reunite the empire. This decision marks the beginning of a period of conflicts, clashes, alliances, and strife with Antigonus fervently struggling for the lion's share. The other successors are soon to respond, awaiting the inevitable final clash. Seleucus paves his way towards kingship. Imitating Alexander, he founds his first royal city, bearing his name in 305 to 304 BC by the river Tigris, the fabled Seleucia on the Tigris. At the same time, 
he begins his own expedition towards the mythical east. His aim was to secure the far ends of his kingdom before attacking Antigonus and to strengthen his army. He signs a treaty with the Indian king Sandracatus and is offered 500 war elephants in exchange for land. He allies with Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, and moves against Antigonus. In 301 BC, one of the greatest battles of the ancient Greek world will take place at Ipsos. Two Macedonian armies are facing each other, two armies of almost equal strength. But the war elephants give Seleucus and his allies the advantage. The soldiers seem to have lost the ground beneath their feet. There is nowhere to run. Who can stand against 500 enormous beasts? Antigonus charges on and dies. A cycle of blood and death has come to an end, with Seleucus the winner. The greater part of the vast kingdom is now under his control, but he must organize it. He soon founds dozens of cities based on the ancient Greek model, with theaters, baths, markets, and gymnasia, where the youths would get military training while the king is worshipped as a god. Dozens of lighthouses spreading Hellenism in a sea of disparate cultures and among them, the city of Dura Europus on the banks of the river Euphrates. It is here, a city honored with the name of his birthplace, where Seleucus was worshiped for centuries as builder and founder. In his own special way, Seleucus kept Alexander's vision alive, a vision of a new nation merging west and east as Alexander intended with the mixed marriages he organized at Susa. It was then, when Seleucus was given a Pama as his wife, the daughter of the satrap of Bactria, Spitamenes, and he was the only one of the successors not to abandon his Iranian wife, maybe because he shared Alexander's vision, maybe because he really loved her, or maybe because she was the mother of his son and heir, Antiochus I. Seleucus was one of the first successors to acquire divine status and honors. It is not a coincidence that sacred symbols of India, like the elephant, and symbols of divine presence from Mesopotamian religions, like the horns, were passed on and incorporated into the Seleucid tradition. Tangible symbols of the new royal power on the threshold between the human and the divine. Nearing 80 years old, but still driven by the fervor and ambition that forged the generation of Alexander's successors, Seleucus begins a new campaign, this time towards Asia Minor and Thrace, probably aiming at Macedonia, his homeland. He turns against his old ally, Lysimachus, and defeats him in the Battle of Chiropedion in 281 BC, expanding his kingdom through new riches and land. What drives him there? His desire to make Alexander's vision a reality and unite all Macedonian dominions? Or the simple need of a man to return after decades spent in foreign lands and complete life's long journey back home? He would not live to see his ancestral lands again. His death came outside Lysimachia in Thrace where he was murdered by Ptolemy Carinus, son of his beloved ally and protector, Ptolemy I. Seleucus I the Nicator 
who was born in 358 BC at Europus, with a birthmark in the shape of an anchor on his thigh, as a sign of his divine descent from Apollo, according to legend. Having conquered and founded numerous cities and the legendary dynasty of the Seleucids, he died a hero. In the minds of the peoples he ruled, he was Nicator, maker of a new era, the time of the Greeks, and history marked him as the greatest king among those who succeeded Alexander. <laughs>